Good afternoon. Tim Pullen here, coming to you from the beautiful front lawn of the Parsonage at Lakeview Church of the Nazarene, Waynesville, North Carolina, on this gorgeous Tuesday afternoon, getting ready for uh, tomorrow night for the study on Wednesday night that will be broadcast on YouTube, and I hope you're looking forward to being a part of that. And I'm, I'm excited about the study for this week, and I think you will be too. <clears throat> I'd like to start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the midst of a beautiful day in uh, this part of the world, but Lord, you know our world is struggling with this virus, and we ask that <clears throat> you would have your way and, and give strength to those who are fighting this disease, and pray that you would empower them to uh, be successful in the fight, <clears throat> both those who are personally struggling because they have the virus and those that are helping them minister to those who minister to those who are hurting right now father and uh, <clears throat> would you the great physician be on the case of each one that's struggling bless us in this time together tonight meet every need represented by those who are looking on <clears throat> and uh, may your word be proclaimed here this evening and may your people be uh, lifted up in the process in Jesus name amen I'd like to share with you tonight a story about a man who had a, a, an incurable disease. <laughs> Since we've been talking a lot about uh, diseases lately, um, I thought it might be appropriate to look into the Bible and, and find an instance where there was a story about uh, someone that had a disease that, uh, that God cured miraculously. And so uh, I looked in the story of 2 Kings chapter 5, where this fellow named Naaman appears. And <clears throat> Naaman was a uh, commander of the army of the king of, of Syria. And uh, I'd just like to share this uh, story with you straight out of the pages of the Bible in 2 Kings 5, uh, beginning at uh, verse 1, <clears throat> where it says, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now, the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. She worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you to Naaman my servant, to you, Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. <clears throat> and when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. <clears throat> but when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not uh, the Abana and far, far the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. <clears throat> but his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word that the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a, wild, of a little child, and he was clean. 
Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so accept now a present from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth, for from now on your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god but the Lord. In this matter may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon, when I bow myself <clears throat> in the house of Ramon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He said to him, Go in peace. Now, uh, no doubt you've heard the expression, The Lord works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform and uh, that principle is definitely at work here in this in significant ways in this story in the healing of Naaman from this terrible and dreaded disease of leprosy in biblical times there was no cure for the disease of leprosy and it was a progressive disease that would ultimately end in death for anyone who contracted it if you had an enemy that you wanted to be taken out of this world, there could be no worse curse that you could sue on someone than to wish upon them this terrible disease which slowly ate away at its victims until they died. But God can use anything to bring glory to His name. And in this particular story, God used even this disease for that very purpose. In the mysterious ways department, you might say, it's it is worth noting that the Lord actually <clears throat> is credited for Naaman's rise to prominence and for his success in the army of Syria. Uh, that may seem almost like a foreign concept to some who think that God only works in the confines of his chosen people to do his work, but God is not just God in Israel. He is God throughout the world. In fact, uh, the psalmist tells us the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and all who dwell therein <clears throat> in uh, Psalm 24 1 and God is at work throughout the world uh, to bring glory to his name in every conceivable way in the Westminster uh, Catechism <coughs> there is a statement that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever so even as he was working in Syria uh, bringing Naaman to prominence, God was also working uh, even through the raids which the Assyrians uh, launched against Israel uh, to uh, set the stage for Naaman's healing which would ultimately bring glory to the Lord. This little girl, we were never told her name, although it would be nice to know, uh, who was taken in a, one of those Syrian raids as a slave would become God's voice in Syria pointing the way to himself through her. Naaman, you see, was so desperate to be cured of his disease that he would do anything. He would jump at any opportunity if he thought it offered any, even a glimmer of hope that he might be cured. And so when he heard of what this little girl had to say, he went directly to the king with uh, her words. And the king of Syria was also very anxious to uh, have his prized general healed. Uh, so he literally signed on to the plan, sending a treasure and a letter to, uh, with Naaman to the king of Israel, Jehoram. <coughs> so we can see that God was setting the stage uh, to use all of these people uh, to bring glory and honor to his name at every level of the social strata in Syria and even back in Israel. Isn't it interesting then that when he got the letter from the king of Syria, Jehoram responded by instantly uh, going into the grieving process. It says we're, we're told he, he tore his clothes, which was a sign of extreme grief. And uh, he believed that it was all a ploy to set the stage for war between Syria and Israel. But it's also interesting that he asked rhetorically, Am I God to kill and make alive? that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? You see, he was so close. He was so close, but yet so far. Jehoram knew that only God could heal a man of leprosy. 
yet he failed to think about consulting God's prophet Elisha uh, regarding the matter. Apparently he thought it was all about himself. He couldn't take his eyes off of himself long enough to realize that this was a chance for the God of Israel to be glorified. This was no doubt in large part due to the fact that he was the son of Ahab who was the vilest king Israel ever had. And uh, he was only slightly better. He did remove the pillar to Baal that his father had erected, but otherwise he pretty much followed the same uh, idols that Ahab had followed before him. <clears throat> But God's servant Elisha sent word to the trembling king, uh, asking, and I paraphrase only slightly, Why have you torn your clothes and gone into grieving? Send the man to me, so that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Well, there's a wake-up for you, a uh, call for you, Jehoram. Uh, it's Copernicus on the line, and uh, he apparently the universe doesn't all revolve around you, after all. <laughs> and as if to drive that point home, uh, Naaman immediately took his whole entourage with him and went to seek out Elisha and stood outside Elisha's door asking for help. But uh, rather than uh, coming out to greet Naaman immediately, Elisha simply sent a servant with a message. And uh, the message en entailed all of the instructions that Naaman needed, which was to go to the Jordan River and wash seven times and, and he would be cleansed. So Naaman, you might say, got a little dose of humility himself. <laughs> Elisha's messenger wasn't the one that he went there to talk to. Um, but <clears throat> as a result of that, Naaman became incensed at the indignity. After all, he was an important person. He expected the prophet to come out and make some big gesture, uh, turning the whole thing into some huge ceremony. But all Elisha did was to send out his messenger with instructions. Welcome back to Earth, Naaman. <laughs> so what's more, the Jordan itself was not a clean, clear-running river. It was muddy, notoriously muddy, whereas the rivers in, in Naaman's homeland, Syria, were much cleaner and clearer. Uh, it would seem to make sense that if you wanted to get clean, you would wash in clean water, but that wasn't God's plan. Once again, Naaman, uh, enraged, uh, storming off, uh, once again, a servant or two, or maybe more, uh, came to the rescue and convinced Naaman that this was actually good news, <clears throat> that the prophet had said he would be healed, <clears throat> reminding Naaman of the reason why he had come to Israel in the beginning. And they were successful in convincing Naaman to do what Elisha had instructed him to do. And as Gomer Pyle would say, surprise, 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 he was healed, just as Elisha had said he would be. So, in gratitude, he returned to Elisha, and Elisha actually came out to see him, and he professed his belief that there is no other God in earth but in Israel. And he offered Elisha a gift in return for what God had done. Of course, Elisha, we read, as we read, refused the gift, despite Naaman's insistence. So Naaman asked for two mules' weight of soil to take with him to Syria so that he could make offerings to God there. And he, he uh, asked for a special indulgence that when his duties required him to escort the king and to worship the god of Ramon in his homeland, and as a result of that, he would have to bow because when the king bows, everyone bows. Uh, he asked that God would not hold that against him. And so Elisha told him, go in peace. Uh, what we see in the story is a number of things. We see that God is able to heal even when man cannot. This is certainly an encouraging in times like these as we watch medical experts all over the world are witnessing firsthand this kind of healing happening uh, on a daily basis. Uh, my own buddy uh, was one of those for whom doctors had basically given up hope and said the family would have to make a decision about whether or not to keep him on life support in a day or so. And before they could get there to make that decision, lots of prayers went up and had been going up. And, uh, and he made a sudden reversal and re turnaround and uh, had an amazing recovery and uh, has since, I believe, has left the hospital now to go home. I know he was, uh, he was on the brink of that over the weekend. And uh, that, of course, is in large part due to the fact that many of you were praying because we had put the, the need out there and you responded. And I believe the Lord has answered that prayer in the affirmative. 
Um, of course, this is not a new phenomenon. God's been healing, going back all the way almost to the beginning of his interactions with humanity. Um, that's just the business he's been in, and he continues to do that even now. And Naaman's story is an example of that, even in the Old Testament. Another thing that we see, aside from the fact that God is able to cure and heal, is that human arrogance or doubt can often get in the way of God's uh, healing power. I remember there's a story in the New Testament where uh, we're told that Jesus went to, I believe it was his hometown, and uh, the people didn't believe in him because they knew him, they watched him grow up, and uh, the Bible says that uh, he was not able to do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. So fa uh, a lack of faith or doubt uh, <clears throat> or even human arrogance can stand in the way of God performing miracles. Uh, we know from the story that uh, Jehoram, uh, his reaction to uh, this, this letter from the king of Syria was to go into meltdown mode and to assume that he was the, the object here and that somebody, that basically the king of Syria was trying to pick a fight with him and uh, that he was doomed as a result of that. <clears throat> he couldn't see beyond the end of his own nose, you might say. And uh, then we saw, of course, uh, how pathetic is it that the king of Syria had more confidence in the God of Israel than the king of Israel did. And that's that, But that was the situation. <clears throat> and we saw even in Naaman's situation his sense of self-importance, and uh, he was a little bit miffed that he wasn't treated uh, with the sense of decorum that he should have. Uh, there wasn't this big ceremony. It didn't become a big uh, deal when Elisha healed him. But it was his, basically his messenger, his servant, told him, just go wash in the Jordan seven times, you'll be clean. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't a big, fat, hairy deal, and that bothered Naaman because he was an important person. And, uh, <clears throat> and yet, we, this leads to the next thing that we see, and that is that God uses the weak and the humble often to accomplish his purpose. It was, remember, it was Naaman's little servant girl who started the whole ball rolling in this thing it, uh, because she simply mused out loud, oh, I wish that my master would go see uh, God's servant Elisha back in, in my homeland. He could heal him of this disease. And, and her, her, Naaman's wife, uh, her mistress, heard this and told Naaman, Naaman told the king, the king sent the letter, and we have this story. But it was a little girl that started it all. And then, of course, uh, <clears throat> Elisha uh, was God's servant, and he used his servant to send the message to Naaman about how to be healed. <clears throat> and when Naaman got incensed and went off in a rage, it was Naaman's servants who talked him into ultimately going ahead with the plan, go wash in the Jordan, what do you have to lose? It's a great thing, a great opportunity. Uh, there's no other way that we know that you can be saved. Hey, this just might work. Um, and so, I don't know how it went, but it may have gone something very much like that. And so Naaman finally did go and, and was washed and was cleansed, just as God had promised. <clears throat> in fact, better than he could have hoped. It said his skin was like that of a little baby's. So how, how, how complete of a healing is it that God does when he does heal. So the question I guess becomes then how do you respond when someone comes to you for help with a seemingly helpless or hopeless situation? Do you go into meltdown like Jehoram did thinking that they're just setting you up for some kind of public failure uh, or trying to discredit you? Or uh, <clears throat> do you turn to the Lord as the only true source of help at such times? There are several things about this story that we should never forget. And one is that God is always able to heal when He chooses to in order to bring glory to His name. Now, He doesn't always heal. We know that. And why He chooses to heal in some cases and doesn't choose to heal in other cases, we'll have to wait to get to heaven to find out. But I believe when we do, what we will understand is that it ultimately it was for God's own glory and it was for the greatest good for the greatest number of God's people. And I believe we'll have reason to praise Him for that when we get there. And another thing that we should never forget is that it's not all about you, it's all about Him. It's not about me, it's not about any of us. It's all about God, it's all about bringing the greatest possible glory to Him. It wasn't about Naaman, it wasn't about Jehoram, 
And it wasn't about Elisha, and apparently, apparently Elisha knew that, which I believe is why he sent his messenger out instead of going out himself. And another thing we should never forget is that no matter where you are in the social strata, uh, <clears throat> that's never a limitation to how much God can use you. As we mentioned, this healing started with a little slave girl. His instructions came through the messenger of God's servant, Elisha, and it was Naaman's own servants that talked him into going ahead with the plan when he was not inclined to do so. In the current day in which we live, uh, there are a lot of people struggling with the coronavirus, and it's a great uh, and very reassuring thing to know that we still serve a God who is in the healing business. We worship Him and we honor Him, and when He chooses to, He can indeed heal, and He does, and we've seen it. And even doctors have said, this is a miraculous recovery. We've heard that more than once. Uh, and of course, there are many other sicknesses and issues that people are struggling with these days. It's, it's not all about the coronavirus. And He's just as able to help and to heal in those situations as in any other. Perhaps we should see our missions as being something like that little girl who was not afraid to mention the name of her Lord and uh, His servant Elisha in the presence of her mistress to muse and reminisce about the homeland and, and that was probably not something that was normally encouraged and yet she did it she did it loudly enough to be heard and as a result uh, Naaman was healed maybe we should see our mission as being something like that or maybe we should see our mission as being more like Elisha who's, who was not afraid to speak truth to power who <clears throat> Ask Jehoram, why have you torn your clothes? Send the man to me. We'll let him see that there's a prophet in Israel. And if there's a prophet in Israel, then there's a God in Israel too. Or maybe we should see ourselves as being like those servants who convinced Naaman to trust in the instructions that he had been given, even when they didn't seem to make sense. You know, there are many people around us dealing with all sorts of problems, as we've already mentioned, and they may have never heard of or even thought about taking those things to the Lord. We can introduce them to that concept. That could be part of our mission. And there are many people who see any such opportunity to direct people to God as a threat to their own position or power or prestige. And we need to remind them that it's not all about them. It's about, it's about the Lord. And we need to encourage them to entrust that need or situation to Him. There are many of God's own people uh, who feel like uh, maybe they're just insignificant, they're unimportant. But it's our place perhaps to remind them that God used a little slave girl to save a mighty general named Naaman. And He used Naaman's own servants to bring him down off his high horse and convince him to go ahead with God's prescription for his cure. And he was cured. And He used His own servant, Elisha. And Elisha used his servant to speak to Jehoram to give him the, the prescription. And he used Elisha to talk his own king down off the ledge. When he said, why have you torn your clothes? And, and uh, God can use, has used in all of these situations, he used people who were servants, who were humble. They didn't have position or rank or power, but they were just willing to be used. And as a result of that, God did an amazing miracle. And if God can do that through a few humble servants, he can certainly use you to accomplish his purpose and bring glory to His name as well. Can I have a word of prayer with you? Heavenly Father, I thank You for this time. I thank You for this opportunity to be with Your people. I pray, Father, that You would minister to them as, as they watch this and that they would be encouraged to trust in You. And I pray that You would help them, whether they are high and mighty and need to be reminded that it's not all about them, or whether they are humble and lowly and feel like they don't have anything to offer. I pray, Lord, that You would help us all to remember it is not about who we are or where we are in our social strata. It's all about you. And our purpose in life is to bring glory to you and to enjoy your presence forever, starting right now. Lord, help us right now to enjoy your presence. And I ask that you would help anyone listening who has never placed their faith in you for anything to do so right now, Father. Not because I said it, but because you're inviting them because you have made yourself available. I pray that you would meet every need represented 
in all of the homes where this is seen and heard. And I pray, Father, that you would bring glory to your name, even through our problems, like Naaman's problem, that you would bring glory to your name through each and every one of them. And help us, Lord, to be willing servants for you. And we'll give you the praise for all that you do, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you have a great evening. The sun's gone down while I was speaking, uh, but it's still a beautiful evening out, out here in front of the parsonage. Someday I hope we can get together and enjoy it together. Hope you have a great night. Hope to see you soon.